I have been working through <clears throat> on previous videos a discussion, theological discussions, uh, or we could say vignettes, on different uh, theological themes. We have looked at bibliology, theology proper. We have seen anthropology, cosmology. Uh, we have looked at the, the Christology, hermartiology first, but then Christology. And now we're on soteriology. That is the study of salvation from a theological perspective. And so I'd like to just talk through that a bit, uh, beginning with the election, the theme of election. And there's Old Testament or Hebrew Bible and New Testament passages that I want to go to. But let me begin by saying, I believe election is looking at not only foreknowledge, but foreloving, both and. God foreknowing and God foreloving. And we see election talked about, uh, or the idea of foreknowing, to, to foreknow, talked about in Amos chapter 3, verse 2, where it says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. God is speaking to Israel there, of you only have I known intimately uh, in a very personal way, sort of like Adam knew Eve. And the Hebrew word yada has that meaning. It also, though, has the meaning of to see something in advance or foresight, foreknowing. An example would be uh, God tells Moses he knows that Pharaoh will not surely believe what he has to say. So I believe that the word has a double meaning, yada in Hebrew and prognosis in Greek. It's interesting in Ephesians chapter 1, we are told that God has chosen us in him, Paul says, verse 4, before the foundation of the world. It is my conviction that God chooses those that he foreknew would believe, as well as foreloving them. And it's all simultaneous with God, since he's outside of time. But I truly believe that God foreknowing what one would do with the gospel becomes the basis of foreloving, both outside of time but one sequentially based upon the other. If we look, for example, at Romans 8, we're told that whom God foreknew, he predestinated. And I would take the double meaning there. God knowing who would say yes to Christ, and on the basis of that, he foreloved them and predestinated them, all outside of time. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, believers are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. It is interesting that we see that described in 1 Peter, where Peter says that uh, speaks of election according to the foreknowledge of God in verse 2. Again, I think the Hebrew word yada, meaning to know, means to foreknow and to forelove. As I said, I believe both are eternal with God, but I believe foreknowledge of who will believe and who will not becomes the basis of God's foreloving. In Romans chapter 9, there is a, there's been a lot of discussion about how to interpret that chapter when Paul uses Jacob and Esau. And Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Or where it speaks of the Lord hardening those that he wills and having pity on whom he wills to have pity. It is my conviction that 
Jacob and Esau become, can I say, uh, models of two types of people. Uh, same, the same way with Pharaoh and those that God pities. It is my understanding of Romans 9 that those who come by faith are seen over against those who come by works. And so instead of believing in double predestination, which, which really is what Calvin taught, that God predestined some to salvation, pitied them, and others he hardened. Uh, it is my understanding that these models of Genesis chapter, or excuse me, of Romans chapter 9, that Paul is using literary models or Old Testament models to represent the types, two types, uh, those who come by faith and those who come by works in the debate that he would be having with uh, a Jewish, can I say, uh, audience at that time. It is interesting that in the Hebrew tradition, God is sovereign in everything except the yurat adonai, except the fear of God. So it is my conviction that these two uh, individuals, Jacob and Esau, and we could also say Pharaoh and those that he pities, represent two types of people, those who come to Christ by faith and those who reject Christ who seek to have salvation through deeds alone. I believe Paul then is looking at groups, not individuals, and Jacob becomes a type of those who are willing to believe and come to Christ by faith. And the same way with Pharaoh, those who are not, those who reject Christ and follow legal righteousness. And so I believe this agrees, in my understanding, with the Old Testament thought of the freedom of the will in Ezekiel 18 and the teaching of Jesus who invites all to salvation in, in him. In other words, Jesus said, O oh Israel, I would have taken you uh, in that first century context uh, when Jesus is speaking, but that you would not. Uh, accept me as uh, the Lord. It is interesting that I believe then that God, that what Paul is teaching is that God has pity on whom he wills and he hardens whom he wills, meaning that those who come by faith, he pities. And those who reject Christ and want to come by works or who reject the faith principle and want to come by works, he allows to be hardened. And so as the potter, those, as the potter then, those who willingly believe, he fashions for salvation. Uh, the idea, I think, is this. Uh, if you are going to play a football game and you have two rules as to the game, uh, it's difficult to play the game. And I think that Christ has one, or God has one basic rule for accepting the plan of salvation, and that is faith, not works. And so I think Paul is in that debate <clears throat> using these literary models of those who are willing to come by faith and those who are seeking to have salvation by works. It's my own conviction that the New Testament teaches whosoever will may come, that salvation is open to all people, and that election is based upon those who are willing to come in God's eternal omniscient or eternal knowledge, knowing who those are. And I'm reminded again how that salvation then is perfectly free. Even after the fall, God said to Abel and to Cain, I should say to Cain, 
he said, sin is crouching at the door, but you may master it. And so even though we have a fallen condition there, there is still the freedom to make a choice, the freedom of choice or will. And that's why the rabbis talked about how God is sovereign in everything except the fear of God, except the Urat Adonai. Furthermore, having looked at that then, again, my conviction is that God foreknew who would accept Christ and who would not. And on the basis of that, in New Testament theology, elected that group that he knew would accept Christ, which certainly includes individuals, but looking <clears throat> at the group itself, just like you only have I known in Amos chapter uh, two, speaking of Israel. And so Amos chapter three, I should say, verse two. So having said that, we then move on to the whole idea of the substitution for sinners. I might just say this, that some have argued and said, well, if no one seeks after God, then God has to convert the will first and give, let's say, faith for one to believe. It's my own conviction that we have, and I appreciated Wesley's idea of prevenient grace, but I think that goes back to New Testament theology where God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And in other words, he's coming to everyone I believe, seeking reconciliation before faith. But there has to be that willingness to accept. And uh, I am also thinking that in Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul talks about, for by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not of you. I take the this there is referring to the whole process is not of you, it's not by works that Paul's saying, which is a theme that Paul uses constantly in the book of Romans and also in Ephesians. I don't believe accepting a gift is works. I don't believe faith personally is works, but simply receiving <clears throat> that great salvation that God has provided. We move on when we're thinking of soteriology to the whole idea of Christ and his substitutionary atonement. And I've already talked about that on a previous video. And I think one of the key passages is Isaiah chapter 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. Kulanu katsum ta'inu. paninu et abon kulanu. All of us like sheep go astray each to his own way but the Lord caused to land upon him the iniquity of all of us. So I believe there is that substitutionary atonement for all. It is essential though that one believe and accept it, but that he died for everyone. Uh, I personally do not believe that the atonement is limited, but unlimited, that even the, can I say, the apostate teachers of Peter, Second Peter, are denying the Lord that bought them. And so again, I feel uh, that it's universal that the atonement is available for everyone. It's interesting <clears throat> that Jesus said in Mark 10, he had not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life as a lutron, as a ransom for many. Again, we have a double teaching of the substitutionary atonement. One in the Hebrew scriptures, Isaiah 53, and then here by our Lord himself, I believe in uh, Mark. Also, it's interesting to me that as we look back in the area of uh, speaking of salvation to the Pesach, to Passover, that we have a beautiful picture of what the Lord has done, typically speaking in Exodus chapter uh, 12 and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 
John would say, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world in John 1 verse 29. And Paul would say, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, verse 7. And he who knew no sin became a sin offering for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It is interesting, as we look at Passover, we have the lamb was killed between the evenings. Christ was also crucified between the evenings. Blood had to be applied over the doorpost. It is interesting that we have redemption through his blood, Paul will say in Ephesians chapter 1. Also, not a bone was broken. And in John 19, verse 36, we're taught that not a bone was broken. And so we see the beautiful fulfillment of the type of Passover. Uh, can I say, looking at the soteriological aspects of even the Hebrew Bible pointing to Christ in what he accomplished. This is followed by the by the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Hebrew Scriptures, which in New Testament thought pictures the sanctity of life, the holy life that is to follow. Paul talks about that, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as well, that we need to lead a holy life in light of having experienced Christ as our Passover. When we think of salvation, we also need to talk about the term redemption. <clears throat> redemption. The Greek word apalutrosis is the word uh, that we would translate redemption. It looked at a price that was paid. When a slave wanted to buy his freedom, he would lay aside a certain amount of money. And once a certain amount had been accrued, he could then buy his freedom. It is interesting that we're told in Ephesians 1 verse 7 that we have redemption, apalutrosis. We have redemption through his blood. So it was Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that was the cost to buy our freedom from sin and from the bondage of Satan's kingdom. It is also interesting that Jesus Christ is the lamb without blame or spot. And again, he went to the cross as the Lamb of God and had a redeeming sacrifice for us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, we're taught that we were redeemed not with corruptible <clears throat> things, such as silver and gold, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It is interesting when we're speaking of that price that was paid. He redeemed us to be a peculiar treasured people to himself. <laughs> and that word peculiar always puzzled me when I was a boy. And I thought, are we, are we weird or what? It's interesting that that word in the Greek Periousion means a treasured people. It goes back to the Hebrew idea of segula, meaning a treasure, treasure. So we're a treasured people, and we've become a treasured people through his redemption, through the price that he paid to effect that and make that possible. Another key word along with redemption and soteriology, salvation and its study, is regeneration. And regeneration <laughs> talks about a new birth. It's interesting to me that in the book of Ezekiel, we're told in Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, that the Lord would sprinkle his people with clean water on the redeemed so that they could be clean. And then he would put his spirit within them. 
I believe in the Hebrew scriptures, this is speaking of regeneration. And he also says he would give them a new heart and take away the heart of stone. For example, in verse 26 of Ezekiel, of Ezekiel 36, it reads, A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit within, verse 27 of Ezekiel 36. And he goes on to say, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. It's my own understanding that that's the new birth talked about in Ezekiel fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It is interesting in John 3, Jesus talks about being born from above, being born anew, and that no one can see the kingdom of God except through spiritual birth. So spiritual birth is that effective new birth, which means God gives us a birth from above. And, and that's really what John, I believe, is speaking about. It's a spiritual birth. We had a physical birth, but this is a spiritual birth, a divine birth. And uh, that is where I believe Jesus is speaking when he talks about the new birth, going back to Ezekiel, but applying it to himself. He kept repeating that. Marvel not, you have to be born again, Nicodemus. It is interesting, the Greek word uh, genao is about being born, and it's being born anew. So the Lord saved us because of his mercy through the rebirth and through the regeneration that that rebirth has accomplished. It is interesting in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it reads in verse 5 that we have received the bath of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Greek word polygenesios means regeneration. So there is that bath, that washing of regeneration. And I think Ezekiel is speaking of that, and it's applied spiritually in the New Testament to what Christ has done. So again, it's not by works, but it's by that spiritual bath of regeneration, a new birthing of the Holy Spirit, where we have now a spiritual cleansing that has taken place. And as a result, we become a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So along with regeneration, we have reconciliation. Reconciliation means friendship with God restored. It looks at how Jesus Christ has restored that friendship with God the Father. In 2 Corinthians, for example, 5 verse 18, it reads that Christ God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That Greek word, katalaso, means to, to turn us back. We were facing opposite directions, and now we're facing each other in that great work of reconciliation. We now have friendship restored with God the Father through Jesus Christ, from the brokenness of sin. And what a beautiful uh, truth. We also, when we're speaking of soteriology, have propitiation. Propitiation is from pelasmos in the Greek, and it means satisfaction. 
Christ has made the satisfaction. As I think about the Hebrew scriptures, I think about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and Leviticus 16, where I think the first goat represents uh, the sprinkling of the blood of the first goat, looking at God being satisfied for the sins of the people, applied in New Testament theology to Christ, that he has satisfied our sins by paying through his death for us. It's interesting in 1 John 2.2, 2, it reads that he is the hilasmas, the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, which also uh, causes me personally to believe in an unlimited atonement. Christ has provided a satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. It is also interesting uh, that in Romans chapter 3, we have a hilasterium spoken of. By that I mean in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, we all have sinned, but we're being justified freely by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as a hilasterion, through faith in his blood. That word, hilasterion, is used of the lid in the Holy of Holies, where blood was sprinkled on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. And that's the word Paul uses. So God provided a satisfaction, a, and it's been translated propitiation <clears throat> by some translations, uh, for our sins. And then one other term, and I think I'll take a break here. One other term is expiation. That is the removal of sins. And I'm thinking of the second goat of Leviticus 16. Remember that second goat was taken to a desert place. Picturing the expiation, the removal of our sins being taken away. So I think we have two goats picturing two things. One, propitiation or satisfaction. The second goat depicting expiation where our sins are being removed. And it's interesting to me as I look at the uh, Hebrew scriptures in Isaiah, 53, and we've alluded this to this before in other videos, he was cut off from the land of the living. In other words, he was cut off uh, of the transgressions of my people, Isaiah says. And the word he was cut off from the land of the living. Uh, as we've said, is from the root gazar, to be cut off. The same root word used as an adjective, uh, the verbal form in Isaiah 53, but as an, as an adjective in Leviticus 16, where the second goat went to an edits gezera, to a cut off land. So I believe we're looking at expiation. That is the removal of sins in that second goat. And it's exciting to me as I think about what is involved in soteriology, some of the great terms that we've looked at, but it's wonderful to know that through the sacrifice of Christ, our sins have been paid for. Uh, we have redemption. We have now a reconciliation with God that propitiation has occurred. That is the satisfaction for the sins of all mankind have taken place. Expiation, there's been the removal. And now the question is, are we willing to accept it and put our faith in Christ who has accomplished all of these wonderful, wonderful works?